Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Hey, Macro Musing listeners. Today's show is a special year in review of the podcast during 2020, where we look back and take stock at the highlights of the past year. To help me do it, I'm joined today by the producer of Macro Musings, Mark DuPont. Mark, welcome to this side of the show. Thanks for having me back, David. It's great to be uh, back in the hot seat again. That's right. We did this about a year ago. We did a show where we recapped the previous year, 2019, so we're doing it this year. And you are normally on the back side of the show. You get the transcripts online. You make sure everything is smooth, up and running. So you're unseen, but you're an important part of the show. And I know I'm very grateful for all that you do, Mark, and I'm sure listeners are as well, as well as what the sound engineers, Robin Lauren and Carter Woolley, provide us. So you're always on the back side of the show, but you've seen everything we've done this year. And you're here today to help navigate us through that, to help me understand, help the listeners understand everything that went on. Because sometimes when you're just in the midst of the show, hosting it or you're a guest, it's hard to see the big picture. Whereas you've had to stare at the show intently for the past year. And just to get things going, I thought I'd throw a few numbers out there about the show this year, Mark. So just for starters, we, including this episode here, we'll have 66 shows this year which is quite a bit compared to our normal run, which is 50 to 52, one a week. So we've quite a few more. And, and the key reason is we ran two a week between March and May during really the intense part of the pandemics. And uh, that meant you guys as well on the backside of the production were very busy, but we we're busy too with the host and the guest. Additional 12 shows there. And we had a few extra bonus shows. We had a bonus show with Claudia Salm, I believe, and also one with Employee America. We took some of their programming where I was a part of and put it on the podcast. And the thing is, of course, this is only part of our responsibilities, right? So we both work for the monetary policy program at Mercatus. So you have other hats you wear. I do too. We have a working paper series, we do op-eds, research. So this is only part of what we do, but it's been a very busy year. A lot of podcasts, of course, based around the pandemic, but a lot of other interesting things going on. But it's been incredibly busy. It's particularly that three-month run there. We did two shows a week. And you've been working from home. I mean, both of us gave up the nice studio in Arlington and had to start doing this from home. So I'm wondering, Mark, how have you uh, persevered? What have you done to keep your sanity during this time? Yeah, well, it's been, it was definitely tough. At the time when the pandemic started, I lived in a three bedroom place with two roommates. Um, So as you could probably imagine, we were all pretty crowded and jammed into this kind of small apartment out in Arlington, Virginia. I remember the first week or two, you know, it was, it was kind of nice adjusting to the work from home type of environment. My commute to work can be pretty tedious sometimes, can run close to an hour and, you know, I got to, got to take the metro and then, you know, walk to the office and, you know, it takes, it takes a decent chunk out of the day and, so it's kind of nice to be able to wake up and then pull out the laptop, get to work and do what you need to do. So that was a nice adjustment for the first one or two weeks. But, you know, after after a few weeks, after a month, you start to get a little stir crazy. And so, you know, I, I like to exercise every now and again. So I would try and get out on the running trails, try and run a little bit, especially as the pandemic came on as it started to get warmer it it naturally was a great time to start sort of get out and Arlington has a really nice bike trail that that runs all along the uh, Potomac River so it's plenty of real estate to run and it wasn't too crowded at the start because people were a little bit spooked to go outside so you got the whole sort of trail to myself which was nice but yeah other than that being able to catch up on the latest Netflix shows catch up on a lot of reading that had been piling up that I hadn't had a chance to to get started a lot of different podcasts, and obviously including Macro Musings work. It was a, sort of a combination of different things, and it gave me, a, you know, the pandemic kind of gave me a chance at the beginning to sort of catch up on a lot of things that I really hadn't had a chance to uh, do, I guess, beforehand because of the workload. Yeah, I think we are both getting cabin fever, though. We're ready to get out and get back to the office. I know you have actually gone in a few times to the office. I'm down here in Nashville, so not as easy for me, but I am Really looking forward to the moment where I can start traveling again and be in Arlington on a regular basis. Yeah, so what about you, David? I know you um, obviously had this really great studio here in the office that you could come into every other week and, and have all the great equipment, all the, the, the great atmosphere to be able to record these shows and just be able to you know mingle with coworkers and so forth. Now you're working at home full time because of the pandemic, and I know you have three kids, you know, various number of pets. So what's it like recording from home? 
not too bad. I, I can't complain. I mean, compared to many people out there who are suffering, but yeah, like most folks, we made adjustments. I jokingly call this the uh, Mercatus Studio Nashville branch <laughs> down here. I've had to turn my uh, office into more of a studio. So, you know, some new stands for the mic, lighting, some new arrangements, some more Ethernet cords through the house. But uh, it's it's gone pretty well. I mean, it's been nice. But like I said earlier, I am itching to get out. And, you know, I live in an area of Nashville, a part of Nashville. It's a little farther out, a little more rural. So been able to get out and do things, projects around the house, try to develop my handyman skills, which aren't very great. Well, one thing I do a lot is running like you. I get out and run a lot. And here I have these country roads, which are really nice, very scenic. There's creeks, there's hills, a lot of scenic things. One challenge, though, Mark, here is there's also a lot of dogs. And you, you've probably encountered dogs running before, correct? Oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, in Arlington, they probably have stricter laws about dogs on leashes and stuff. Here, they have laws, but no one enforces them because you're out in the country and you run against up against one or two dogs, you can handle them. But I've, I've actually had several times I've encountered a pack of dogs, four or five, six of them. And one time in particular, they, they really almost got me, to, to be frank, they... This pack mentality kicked in, and they they were circling me. And I don't know if you remember from Jurassic World, where those raptors are circling the handler, and he tries to put his hand in and control them. And that's how I kind of felt, but I was terrified. So after that, I started carrying some gear with me. And and actually, it made me think of the Fed. I I carry a tool set with me, Mark, that I use as the situation escalates. So now I, I carry dog treats. And, you know, dogs, many dogs like the dog treats. It's kind of like the interest rate cuts for the Fed. I also have a, a taser with me, and I, I view my taser as forward guidance. I use the taser to make noise and a very, very sharp sound and, and the lights, and that usually can signal the dog to back off and hopefully never have to use it. In fact, you don't want to use a taser on a dog because to get a taser to work on a dog, you're probably in trouble because you have to get right on top of them. So it's more of a forward guidance instrument. And third tool, my toolbox is pepper spray, which you know I consider that to be like negative interest rates. It burns. The financial system hates negative rates and you know the animal wouldn't want to have pepper spray. I haven't had to use it yet. And finally, I have this kind of a, it's a baton you can expand out like police carry. If I bring that and hold it up, just seeing it will often scare a dog off. And I use it in that order. And I consider the baton maybe like yield curve control, you know. They threaten to keep interest rates in a certain range. The baton can threaten, I'm going to you know, beat you <laughs> if you misbehave. Now, again, I, I never have beaten a dog, to be clear. But I, I have these tools I go through, and they give me a lot more confidence when I run. So any event, a bit of a diversion here. But all these things have kind of you know, been great in me maintaining my sanity. And, and again, I've been blessed. I've had a job. I've had great work. I've had you know, the chance to speak to many interesting people on this podcast. We're doing interesting things at Mercatus. So... All in all, I think it's been a great run, very busy year. But enough about me. Let's let's switch gears. I know the listeners want to hear the podcast highlights from 2020. And uh, let's go ahead and take a look at that. And I'll turn it over to you, Mark, since you're the producer. I'll let you run with our conversation on the show. Yeah, of course. And obviously, you know, it's like you mentioned uh, at the start of the show, it's been a long year. We've had uh, a lot more episodes than usual because of what we were running those two episodes per week for about three months. A lot of content, a lot of very interesting content, especially we're in the midst of the pandemic. The Fed was very active in um, trying to treat this recession from a sort of monetary standpoint. So in that case, yeah, let me just start this by asking you, what are your sort of big takeaways from this year of podcasting? Well, the first thought that comes to mind is that you know most of our programming this year was driven by the pandemic. Not all of it. We had some shows that weren't tied to it. Most of it was closely tied to the pandemic, from the CARES Act to the Fed facilities to Treasury markets crashing to the Fed backstopping the the global dollar funding system. It was mostly about pandemic, the responses to it, and and what happened. And it's interesting to think, had there been no pandemic, what would we have covered? Or alternatively, what did I think we were going to cover coming into this year? And the things that, you know, came to my mind would have been, you know, topics that we did touch on, but we would have focused on more had there been no pandemic, such as how long would the expansion continue? So we had this you know, decade long expansion, we're getting your full employment, and the Fed had got unemployment down to three and a half percent, no inflation. Could that have gone on longer? I think that would have been an interesting topic. Had we uh, persevered, how low would interest rates go? That was a conversation coming into this year. The plumbing issue from the repo crisis in September was something we were going to talk about. And then the big review. I mean, the review was on our radars. And some of those topics did get discussed this year, 
you know, the Fed finished its review. We had the March crisis in Treasury markets, which is similar to the repo, and we had plumbing problems there. Unfortunately, the long expansion ended. But overall, I mean, just to summarize, I, the key point is most of our programming was tied to the pandemic, which affected, you know, the content as well as the pace, as you mentioned. We had multiple shows there. And one of the interesting things I learned, Mark, is is how nimble you have to be. So prior to the pandemic, we would have maybe three, four shows in the pipeline ready to go, which could have been recorded month, month and a half, two months ago. And there were actually some shows we dropped. You know, we had a George Selgin show that we completely dropped and another person because life comes at you fast and the news cycle was incredibly fast. So that is the big, I think, theme, big lesson I learned is when you have a big event like the pandemic, it does shape your programming and, it, you know, you roll with it. I think it turned out to be a, a good year of, of shows, but definitely shaped by the pandemic. Yeah, David, and you mentioned that, you know, that this sort of pandemic was defined by the pace. And the pace was definitely something that for the first few months was definitely apparent. You know, like we were, uh, at least on the production side, you know, we were turning out episodes. You know, you'd record an episode on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and we'd have to turn it out to get it out the Monday. So uh, that was back when Carter, our previous sound engineer was working on those so shout out to him he was he did a fantastic job you know doing the editing for that and being able to turn it around so quickly and and, you know we almost had a worry with with some of these shows that you'd record one day and then because of how quickly the fed was moving which is so uncharacteristic that you know we were worried about the topical nature of the content you know was it was it going to be outdated by the time the show even aired were they going to make a big announcement going to be made just like a day or two or even 24 12 to 24 hours after the episode was recorded so the pace was definitely blistering and and you know i think shout outs to everybody who helped make that happen and helped us uh put out those episodes in a timely manner let me just mention that for our listeners you know it's not just recording the show you guys have to edit it and then you have to do the transcripts as well and the transcripts take time you know the transcripts may take as much time as anything that you do on the back end and two shows a week you know monday and wednesday (laughs) that is a lot of turnaround you guys were busy and again you wear other hats this is not your only job at mercatus so kudos to you mark and your team for the hard work you did during that time thank you so much But yeah, let me just focus a little more on the content side. So what would you say were some of the big themes that were covered during the uh, episodes throughout the year? Yeah, so there were a number of themes marked this year, and I won't do justice to all of them and to all the shows. And again, thank you to all the guests who've been on. But I'll try to rattle off a few that stand out to me and encourage our listeners to go check them out. But one was just, of course, the initial response. You know, should the Fed respond and then how should it respond? And there was some early debate whether the Fed should respond. I believe in February there was talk and the Fed was beginning to cut interest rates. Some were questioning the Fed was just cutting rates because you know the markets were panicking. It, it hadn't dawned on us yet how serious the pandemic would be. But we had some interesting conversations about the Fed being aggressive or not with Scott Sumner. I believe he was the first guest that talked about this on the program once the pandemic kicked in. But Jim Bianco came on, Claudia Somm. Sen Voiger and Alp Simsek, we had some interesting conversations about the uh, central bank's response. But once it became clear that there was something that needed to be done, I mean, Congress needed to act, the Fed needed to act, it was a question of how to respond. And in terms of the Fed, huge debate emerged about the facilities it had created. It had these, we would call liquidity facilities and credit facilities. The liquidity facilities included the commercial paper facility, money market fund facility, primary dealer facility, all the facilities that effectively backstop the global shadow banking or dollar funding system. And there's a conversation to have about that, but I think everyone agreed that had to be done at that time. But what was more controversial were the credit facilities, the two bond market facilities, the uh, municipal facilities, and the, the Main Street facilities. Those are more credit facilities, which in an ideal world would have been provided by Congress via some kind of emergency fiscal authority or fiscal facility. So you don't want to depend on the Fed to do the job of Congress, and that's effectively what was happening. And in fact, we, you know, we're recording this here at the end of 2020, and we just had a relief bill that was passed through Congress. One of the big holdups was Senator Toomey addressing this very question. He was uncomfortable with these credit facilities being restarted. He was okay with the liquidity facilities, but he was worried about the credit facilities, and they resolved the wording around it. But this is a conversation that needs to be had, you know. Congress needs to step up and provide, I believe, in my view at least, a better way for fiscal policy to respond 
to emergencies to crisis as opposed to relying on the Fed, having the Fed do the heavy lift for it. So we had some great conversations there with, you know, Lev Menin, Catherine Judge, George Selgin, Peter Connie Brown. And there was, you know, some discussion there. We also have brought on Skanda Armanov and Yakov Fagan about using the municipal facility, which at that point hadn't been adopted, but it finally did. Also, David Schleichner came on, talked about the municipal facilities. And so there was an interesting discussion, you know, not just should the Fed respond, but how should it respond? And the conversation on starting the Fed, at least, evolved from there to later in the year. Well, what more can the Fed do? Once it's, you know, it has the facilities, it was doing QE, it was, it had cut rates. And so there was a conversation about yield curve control. We talked about that quite a bit on the show. Negative interest rates never really were, I think, a viable option. And something that came up later this past year was dual interest rates. So we had Megan Green, Eric Lonergron on to talk about that. Also, a tool that's come up some this year was the introduction of central bank digital currency. That would be one way to do helicopter drops to make it easy to get money to people from the central bank. We had Jesus Fernandez of La Verde on to talk about that. So I guess one, to summarize, one, I think, important theme was the response to the crisis, how to do it, what can be done, what new tools should be introduced. There were other shows on that as well. I think another one would be the plumbing issues, which is something near and dear to my heart. I had a number of guests on, as you recall, Mark, from late last year. We talked about the repo crisis in September had some really good conversations there. Well, well, this year in March, the Treasury market, as our listeners know, was imploding. And had the Fed not stepped in, it would have been a melt, full meltdown of the Treasury market. And so I had on Daryl Duffy, Nathan Tankus, Bill Nelson, Peter Stella. We got into the plumbing and what can be done. Oh, Also, we, we talked about the importance of repo markets with Caroline Sissoka. Really great conversation. Probably one of the highlights of the year was her podcast, one of the top ones in my view. Also related to the plumbing issues, we got into a conversation about global dollar funding. So we were thrilled to have a number of good guests on that. Brad Setzer, Adam Chus, Danielle Gabor. Not only did the treasury markets kind of come crashing down, but dollar funding was under pressure. And so the Fed created a number of facilities and opened up some of them had existed before these liquidity facilities, but also expanded its reach. So it opened up and expanded the number of dollar swap lines. It also created a new repo facility for foreign governments to deposit treasuries and get dollars. So the Fed effectively opened branches around the world and provided a dollar backstop, which made the crisis from becoming worse. So I think that that's a big thing. So again, this to summarize, the, the first big theme I, I looked to was the crisis mode, the response to it some of the plumbing issues. Now, David, obviously the pandemic and, and, you know, sort of the effect internationally and domestically of the pandemic to the monetary system, a lot of that overshadowed what was supposed to be a big issue this year, and that was the Fed's framework review. And I know this is something that in 2019, at least, you had a lot of shows, you know, in anticipation of even before the pandemic, you know, there was a lot of anticipation of how this was going to turn out, um, what it was going to result in. So tell us more about the shows that you did this year that discussed that a little more deeply. I know a lot of those shows may have been more towards the end of the year, but uh, yeah, tell us about the Fed's framework review. Yeah, so the Fed did announce its framework review conclusions in August. As we all know now, the Fed has an average inflation target. And uh, yes, this has been a hobby horse of mine. As you know, last year I wrote some papers, had a number of guests. So we followed up this year. George Selgin was on the show, Robert Purley, Julia Coronado. We talked about what has this new framework accomplished? And I think we'll talk more about it later, but I think next year, 2021, will be the true test of the Fed's new framework, the average inflation framework. But we also you know, brought in, I think, other guests who kind of maybe shed light on frameworks. So we brought in Mark Lavoie. He's in Canada. We talked about the Bank of Canada and how it does its framework every five years and how it does monetary policy operations. I was also privileged to have Governor Benjamin Diokno from the Central Bank of the Philippines, and he's the head of that. He runs that, and they have an interesting framework as well. And and then it's also worth mentioning, although my focus was on the Feds, the Eurozone and the ECB had its own framework review. They started and kind of stalled because of the pandemic, and I believe it's up and running again. And we had a number of people talk about that. Most recently, Ethan Elzeski, but we also had Ashoka Modi and Vincent Grossman-Worth. So they're doing their review at this time as well. 
And as you know, they've tended to undershoot their target even more so than the Fed has. But the hope, at least, and the direction that these reviews are going, and, and definitely in the case of the Fed, maybe in the case of the ECB, is there's some kind of makeup policy that's been introduced. And the makeup policy, of course, is tied to inflation targeting. But as listeners know, I think a better way to sell that is in terms of total spending or, or incomes. But that was a big, I think, a big deal this year, even though the pandemic did steal a lot of, of the limelight, kind of sucked the oxygen out of the room. We still had some good conversations about the framework review. Okay, David. So another theme I wanted to cover, uh, sort of like a miscellaneous economic topics, because obviously, other than, you know, focusing on the effects of the pandemic and, and, you know, the greater framework review questions in 2020, you also touched upon some really interesting other economic topics. For example, you had Matt Iglesias on the show talking about his new book, One Billion Americans, which posed some really, really great economic questions and economic thoughts from him. So yeah, tell us more about some of the sort of miscellaneous economic topics you discussed during 2020. Yeah, Matt Iglesias was a fun one to have on the show. Maybe to set him up, talk about another kind of idea that we brought up on the show that I think his book responds to, at least indirectly. And that is what I would call the Japanification of advanced economies. So as many listeners know, rates around the world have been going down for decades and, and pushing countries closer and closer to the zero lower bound. Some have even gone negative. And so uh, one person we had on that was very interesting early in the, the year was uh, Paul Schmelzing. He came on actually before the pandemic hit, but he has a paper that shows there's been basically a 500-year secular decline in interest rates. And that you know, what we're experiencing now is just part of that broader trend. In fact, the interest rates that went up in the 70s kind of a detour from the broader trend. We're kind of back on path. And you know, if you extrapolate his trend out, it's, it's almost inevitable the advanced economies are headed down there. We also had Robin Harding of Financial Times on. He talked about lessons from Japan and what it means for countries like the US and the Eurozone that are slowly looking and becoming more like Japan in some dimensions, at least. So Matt Iglesias' book, One Billion Americans, it's, it's a great way to reply and to respond to those concerns. If you have more people, it's a key part of economic growth. They're both an input to growth, but they also are an important part of generating ideas. Kind of the Paul Romer, Julian Simon idea that you, you know, the more people you have, the more positive externalities, increasing returns to scales, idea generation emerges. And so his book makes it, in my mind at least, a compelling story for having higher levels of immigration and how you do it and, and timing, that's a whole different discussion, but it's essential. And as well as the fact that our fertility rate's going down. Sam Hammond and Brink Lindsay from the Niskanen Center, they also have a paper that shares some of the similar views of Matt Iglesias. We need you know, more people. Now, they stress a better child policy as well, so we increase the fertility rate and have more immigrants. But we, we want to fight this Japanification through more robust growth going forward. One last thing I would just mention, which was kind of interesting to me at least, a show or a couple of shows that really had a good turnout, as I remember, were shows on modeling. So uh, kind of an esoteric topic, but we had Eric Sims from Notre Dame and Ben Mole from the London School of Economics, and they were talking about the new heterogeneous agent models and, and how they apply in macroeconomics and the lessons learned. And, and these shows were surprisingly interesting. I mean, I find them interesting. I wasn't sure the technical discussions and models would be appeal to listeners, but we had some good numbers for those shows. So those are some of the other miscellaneous topics I thought would be worth mentioning. All right. Yeah, David. So obviously, to recap, we've hit on a lot of great themes this year because of how much great content we've had throughout the course of 2020. Were there any really big misses for you this year, do you think, in the podcasting front? I mean, obviously, you know, the pandemic dramatically altered the course of the economy and we had some great programming that was planned out. You may have wanted to have a specific guest on. You may have wanted to talk about a specific topic and that got totally thrown out the door once, once March came around. So what were some of your big misses this year? Yeah, Mark, there were a few misses, I guess, if you could call them that. I mean, I, I had scheduled Janet Yellen, and uh, the timing hadn't worked out. And we kind of kept pushing forward the date until the pandemic finally hit, and that got in the way. And now she's Treasury Secretary, so I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. And something else, just on a, another level, we had some great meetings planned with governors from the Board of Governors at the Federal Reserve. And those got canceled. They weren't coming on the podcast, but just meetings like that, meetings with other researchers, it definitely 
change some of what we do. But of course, we adapted as well. As you know, we had a conference this summer, joint with the Cato Center. George Sells and I organized a conference this summer on some of these very topics we discussed. And I would encourage listeners to go check out the conference. But we had a lot of great guests. Some of the guests were on the podcast, were on at this conference discussing you know, with the Fed's response facilities, all those wonderful things. So definitely some misses, but we, we try to make up for it by adapting. And hopefully we did as good as we could. Yeah, well, speaking of Yellen, too, obviously, I know there's a number of guests you'd kind of view as your dream guests, you know, the people that you'd love to get on the show that you have been trying to get on the show since you started a number of years ago. So who would you say are your biggest or is your biggest dream guest for Macro Musings for the Future? Well, there's a number of people I'd love to get on the show. We've had some great guests already. I'd like to reschedule Janet Yellen. I would like to get Ben Bernanke on the show. I would love to have a conversation with him about some of his recent work. He's done some really fascinating work on makeup policy. You know, he authored the temporary price level targeting idea, which is, I think, an interesting idea. And he's done some interesting work with some of his colleagues, former colleagues at the Board of Governors, Michael Kiley, on equilibrium interest rates. So I think if I had to pick one, probably Ben Bernanke at this point. But, you know, as times change, I'm sure my wish list will change as well. Now, just a funny story about Ben Bernanke real quick. Now, uh, as David mentioned before, I used to wear a lot of hats with this podcast. And before we had Robin and Carter coming in, I used to also do all of the recording and sound engineering on my own. And back when, uh, back before the pandemic and back when we were able to travel places to record with guests, we had traveled to the Brookings Institute to record with Donald Cohn back in the day. And, um, you know, it was a great interview. He was a great guest. It was a fantastic time. And I remember as we were leaving we saw that the light in Ben Bernanke's office was on and the door was open. And I know, I, I can't remember if he was in the office or out of the office at that point, but I know that David had wanted to sneak in and, and drop off an NGDP targeting mug on his desk. And unfortunately, that did not come to fruition. We look back on it now as maybe a missed opportunity. But, you know, Ben Bernanke, if you happen to be listening, we'd love to get you a mug. We'd love to get you on the show. Let's make it happen in 2021. Yeah, I don't want to be that guy, that obnoxious guy who pokes his head in the office and says, hey, Ben Bernanke. So I want, it to, I want our meeting to be a, one that is well-received by both sides. But yeah, great memories, Mark. Lots of fun on this show. Now, Mark, let me throw some questions back at you. You've been asking me a lot of questions. I want to think more about our audience. So do you have any data on who's listening, where they're listening, anything like that? Yeah, so in 2020, we had listeners from totaling from uh, 186 total different countries or territories, phenomenal numbers. So, you know, we thank all those listeners across the world for tuning in every week. And also, I'd like to do a little breakdown of uh, countries, states, and uh, cities and metro areas. So top five countries, not including the U.S., because the U.S. is by far has the most listeners out of any country. But as far as the top five, it would be the U.K., was next after the U.S., then it was Canada, Australia, Germany, and then Sweden, which I thought was very interesting. I don't know if you had any thoughts on why those countries may have the most. I imagine that for the U.K., Canada, and Australia, you know, those are English-speaking countries. So I figured naturally those countries might be listening in more than others across the world. Yeah, Sweden's interesting. Maybe, you know, all the great monetary economists in Sweden. I don't know. <laughs> and then moving on to the different states, we had uh, California was number one. And then with uh, New York coming in next, Texas, Illinois, and then Virginia. And I think based on our metrics, I think Virginia sort of includes, when they're breaking it down by state, I think, you know, since D.C. is not a state, they kind of lump it in with Virginia. So I think that's probably why Virginia clocks in at number five, and that would make a lot of sense. I was surprised that that wouldn't be higher in the list, that Virginia wouldn't be higher considering this is a sort of the center of policymaking, you know? I would figure that as far as listeners are concerned, I guess obviously California and New York have such large populations, but I'm surprised that a lot of our listeners aren't much more focused in the D.C. area. I guess if we move on to metro areas, I guess it's why they're higher on the list. So actually, number one is New York City, as far as listeners from the top cities. D.C. is number two on that list. Then it's the San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose metro area is number three. Uh, Chicago comes in at number four, and then L.A. rounds out the top five there. So, yeah, it's sort of a quick breakdown of, of where our listeners are coming from across the world, across the country, in the various different cities across the U.S. So, yeah, thanks again to all our listeners for, for tuning in.
Well, that's interesting, and it's great to know we got this audience around the world. I have actually met some of these people. When I go to conferences, they often will come up to me and introduce themselves. So I, I've had people everywhere from you know Australia, Europe, Asia. One time I had a, a central bank official from the Republic of Georgia reach out to me. So I, I know there's people listening all around, and we appreciate you, you guys doing so. Well, Mark, let's maybe change focus a little bit here. Instead of looking at the audience and the listeners directly where they are, let's look at what they listened to this year. What was their top show? So I think it'd be great to break this down into maybe a top 10 list. And there's many ways to dice and slice this. And you know, like many measures, it's going to be imperfect because some shows have been out there for nine months. Some have only been out there for one month. But we're just going to keep it simple and say what shows got the most absolute listens, so the, the total number of listens. And let's do like a top 10 countdown, all right, starting with number 10 and working our way up. So do you have a list where you can do that, Mark? I do. Okay, why don't you shoot away then? All right. Well, sounds good. So at number 10, we start off with when Scott Sumner came on the show at the beginning of the pandemic talking about how central banks should respond to the coronavirus threat. That was number 10. I don't know if you had any specific thoughts you wanted to mention on that episode. Just briefly, that was the first show where we were focused on the pandemic. So I think I mentioned earlier, that's where we started talking about whether the Fed should respond or not. So it was a very timely and interesting conversation that, that went on for most of the year. Yeah, but then number nine, we have John Sindrew on the global financial flows and the balance of trade. Yeah, on that show, we talked a lot about the savings glut, and he has a different view of interest rates than myself. Very interesting conversation, though. He's a Wall Street Journal reporter. He, he covers international markets as well as aviation. So that was a fun show. Yep. And then number eight, we had Jim Bianco on talking about the policy responses to the coronavirus, including the details, the implications, and the, the concerns moving forward. Yeah, on that show, we talked about, I think one thing that was important we focused on was the repo response because, you know, the Fed stepped in to prevent the Treasury market from collapsing. And, and he had some concerns about that, among other things. But that was an interesting show as well. Yeah, and then number seven, we had Matthew Klein discussing sort of global trade, inequality and international conflict. So that was a show about the book that he has out with Michael Pettis. And he kind of takes the opposite view of uh, John Sindro, which you mentioned earlier where they look at, Michael and, and Matthew look at current account surpluses and, and these big trade imbalances as precursors to other important problems that emerge across the world. Interesting conversation for sure. Yeah, and then we had number six, we had Brad Setzer talking about the global dollar shortage in relation to COVID-19 and sort of the implications for worldwide trade imbalances. Yeah, again, another international finance, international money conversation, uh, but this was a fun one because we talked about the... Uh, dollar funding crisis during the COVID crisis and, and how the Fed's response, how its use of dollar swap lines was hugely consequential. Of course, Brad has this, this you know incredible knowledge about the institutions, the tools, the policies, and people involved. So it was, it was a great conversation. Yeah, now moving into the top five. Number five, we had Nathan Tankis on talking about uh, public finance and the COVID-19 crisis period, sort of talking about the consolidated budget balance view and its implications for policy. Now, that was a fun show. So Nathan Tankis, I think many of you know, is, is an mm tier, and he has an interesting perspective, and I think a good one when it comes to looking at the finances of the government from a consolidated a budget balance perspective. And we had some good discussions about you know, does the government finance itself through the Fed or through Treasury? You know, which form of liabilities, reserves or Treasury liabilities? Which ones are the, are the better way to finance government? What's the proper mix? How should it be done? But the, it's been fun to watch Nathan. Nathan really has blown up this year. He's kind of, you know, at least in our world, he's become something of a, a little bit of a celebrity, you know, kind of coming out of nowhere. And uh, he, he's made a, a big name for himself. So it's fun to have him on the show and discuss his ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And then number four, this is, I guess, that David mentioned a little earlier when we were talking about the themes, but we had Paul Schmelzing on talking about the uh, super secular decline of global interest rates. Yeah, for Paul Schmelzing, we've talked about him a lot. I just encourage listeners to go back and take a look at the show as well as his interesting paper. Now, that gets us through the top seven. So we have the top three to go. And I, I think it's only appropriate for the top three, the elite, the cream of the crop, the most listened to in 2020, 
I think it's appropriate that they get a drum roll. So for number three, who was it? And for number three, we had Eric Sims on the new Keynesian modeling and the future of macroeconomics in a low interest rate environment. All right. So who knew that the show on modeling on tank models would be so exciting? But congratulations, Eric, on a great show. Okay. Let's get the drum roll going again for number two. For number two, we had Jim Tankersley on talking about the state of the middle class and how we can boost economic growth in the future. All right, Jim, great job. And thank you listeners for making that a top show. It was a great book and he wasn't too long ago. All right, so we're down to number one here. So I'm going to get the drum roll again. And for the number one show, we had Adam Tews on dollar dominance, the Eurozone, and the future of global finance. Okay, so Adam Tews was number one, the number one show, and dollar dominance, great topic, another topic near and dear to my heart, so I've written about it myself. I know we talked about that. We also talked about the dollar funding crisis, so check that show out. That was number one for 2020. All right. Now we've discussed everything there is to discuss about 2020, I think. And it was obviously a tough year for many people, although it was an interesting year for us as far as different macroeconomic topics to discuss. So what about next year? 2021, there's a lot of question marks. You know, it's a blank page. What do you think is going to happen looking into 2021? I can't be certain, but if I had to guess, I would say there'd be several things. I think uh, one question is going to be who will be the Fed chair. Now, Jay Powell is a good chance he'll be the Fed chair, but there'll be some consideration next year because his term will be up in 2022. So I think there'll be a lot of people talking about that. I I also think, after talking to some previous guests on the show, that the vice chair for supervision will actually be a big discussion as well, maybe even bigger than the chair, because Randy Quarles' time as the vice chair for supervision is up. And with you know, President Biden, and he has a more progressive economics team, they may want someone who's a little bit more, takes a different view than Randy Quarles on, on bank supervision. I think those will be some interesting stories to follow. I, I think also Janet Yellen's role in all of this, I think she will help guide their conversation. I expect her to you know really supercharge the the FSOC and, and other regulatory bodies that she can influence. And I think maybe the last thing I would note is just the fate of the average inflation targeting's credibility. I mean, will the Fed be able to avoid raising rates in 21 if we have this big boom that emerges? Because I think many people see a big boom coming. And uh, the question is, can the Fed allow some overheating, some catch-up growth as implied by its new average inflation target? And it's not clear to me that they can, but 2021 will be a true test of that. Yeah, and obviously we have all the news coming out about, you know, when hopefully when the vaccine will be available, we'll start to see things maybe trickling back to normal as well. So, yeah, so there'll be there's a lot of interesting things that are on the horizon for 2021 and, you know, hopefully we'll have many great shows next year covering all these potential topics. How about some closing thoughts as we, we sort of come to the end of this year in review? What are some other closing thoughts you have, David? Well, I just want to, again, thank all the listeners. We couldn't do the show without you. It's great to have you listening, have you on board. It's been great to meet some of you in the past. And I look forward next year, hopefully, to meeting you in person again at conferences. We've talked about taking this show on the road, maybe having, you know, stopping in some cities, doing recordings there. So hopefully we can begin to do that probably second half of the year. But I definitely want to engage with you listeners. And we have also, due to popular demand, our likely to have nominal GDP targeting mugs available next year. I know I've gotten a lot of requests for that, and this is something that's been beyond my control, but we have pushed, I know Mark's pushed, I have too, and I I believe Mercatus will be making the nominal GDP targeting mugs available in 2021. So just stick around and we'll let you know where to get it. Yeah, and just a few closing thoughts on my end from the producer's standpoint. Obviously, I'd like to thank all the listeners. I'd like to thank all the guests for coming on the show. I'd like to thank the two sound engineers we've had throughout the past year, Grob and Laura and, and Carter Woolley. They've done a fantastic job with everything, as I've said. I'd also like to thank my colleague, uh, Nick Reardon, who's really helped out 
on the transcript side, helping me uh, pump out each transcript since, you know, me and him both wear other hats at, at Mercatus. You know, it's, he's been a real help to me getting them out week to week. And speaking of the transcripts as well, I just want to say hopefully in the next year, I know many listeners might know we have a lot of old episodes that aren't currently up on the website as far as transcripts are concerned. So in the next couple months of 2021, we're hoping to get all of those old transcripts up. So you'll be able to reference those when checking out a lot of our older episodes. And also apologies to any of the guests who haven't received their their mugs yet. I know there's a few internationally, there's a few domestically. It's been definitely very difficult getting all this stuff out. Our offices have been sort of in a state of being opened and closed. So it's been tough to sort of get in and, and get the mugs shipped, especially internationally. So hopefully with, uh, within the next few months, as hopefully things calm down a little bit more, uh, I'll be able to get in and get everybody their mugs who, who have not received them yet. All right. Well, thank you, Mark, for joining us today and navigating us through the year that was 2020 in podcasting. Yeah, I look forward to a great next year. Um, I look forward to all the awesome content we're going to be pushing out in 2021. So thank you, David. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.